Today we're joined by Steve Milner of Gen2 Fund Services, Charlie Eaton of Eaton Partners, and David Tegler of Proskauer. Gentlemen, welcome to ProofCap today. Thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, David. We are talking about fund formation, uh, specifically with regards to first-time funds. Maybe starting with a question uh, for uh, David Tegler from Proskauer. Walk us through what is distinct between, again, the terms and conditions and putting the fund together versus the, uh, the management company that oversees it all. Your typical structure in involves the fund, which is being raised and has limited partners invest in it. The fund has a general partner entity which receives the carried interest and is also the vehicle through which the principals make their commitment to the fund. And then there's also a management company, which is a limited liability entity through which the organization is run, the employers are hired, the rent is paid, the telephones are rented, um, and, and which receives all the management fee from the funds. People often come to us and want to raise a first-time fund and their, their key focus is the fund itself and their relationship with the LPs and offering that vehicle. Um, we often ask them to take a step back and explain to them that these upper tier entities, the general partner entity and the management company, are crucial in terms of the personality of the organization because those are the entities where you decide how the carry is split up amongst the principals, how investment decisions are made, how key decisions regarding the organization are made, and especially for emerging managers, many of the people coming in to these organizations have left other firms because of governance issues or disagreements at their prior location, and so they come in with strong opinions about what their firm should be like. And, um, you know, the GPs really need to, um, in the immortal words of Pete Townsend, who are you? In many cases, a new uh, firm will bring in an external investor, sometimes call it a cornerstone investor or an anchor investor, to help them uh, get to the starting line of, of running their own private equity firm. Um, what kind of complexities does that introduce when there is a third-party investor in uh, not only the you know, contributing capital to the fund, but in many cases taking a stake in the management company? Well, from the limited partner's perspective, control by the fund managers is paramount. and. Often when anchor investors come into an upper tier entity, you'd be at the management company or the GP entity, um, in connection with their bargain for being an anchor investor, they, they would like to have a seat in the investment committee, um, a, a, a voice in management, um, or some sort of a vote in the future of the firm. And if you, if you bargain for that and you give that to an anchor investor, limited partners might be concerned about whether the fund managers are really calling the shots and making the investment decisions. Charlie, have you seen uh, circumstances where sort of the, the bargain between the founders of a firm is not properly structured and that has led to uh, perceived challenges from the LPs and real challenges down the road? If there's too much, um, too much power being given to the outside uh, anchor investor, I think investors want to know what are they bringing to the table? Uh, is it just capital or are they uh, they are able to provide some uh, deal sourcing to the uh, GPs and uh, have you given too much of the shop away to get that capital. All that is uh, you got to be really carefully thought through and negotiated and I think the, the lawyers, the, the um, administrative assistants and the placement agent can all opine and help you know, make sure that it's properly aligned and not, not overly done and we have had instances where uh, the GPs have given away way too much before they got involved with us, and we've just told them that's that's not going to be that's going to be a non-starter in the marketplace. Well, how about just the terms between the founders themselves? Even if there's not a third-party investor, what are some examples of an unstable, uh, you know, set of um, circumstances at, at the upper tier where you can foresee problems down the road? One of the things that LPs examine at the upper tier is um, the dynamic between how much carry an individual principal is receiving and how much of a commitment they're making to the fund. Investors like to see um, a significant amount of your personal net worth um, invested in the fund if you're a principal. And if you're receiving a significant amount of carry, but you're not putting in a, a comparable amount of capital into the fund, um, that could create a, um, an alignment of interest issue with respect to the principals and the LPs. And another feature that often comes up is um, the, these funds are formed as pools where the carried interest um, is calculated based on net return. But sometimes at the upper tier, principals are compensated based on individual deals that they worked on as opposed to deals as a whole in the fund. And that also can have a misalignment of interests between the principals and the fund. Sometimes the inverse is true because if uh, if the carry is only going to those that put up the GP capital, some of the really good uh, producers to that fund, the, the really good investors, might not have had the wherewithal to put a lot of capital up. And it's not 
necessarily an alignment of interest that, that is good for the investors, the LPs, if the carry is only going to those who put up the initial capital. Uh, if, you're, if you're bringing more to the party than just capital and maybe you didn't have that much capital put up, you still want part of the carry and, and investors want to see who gets the carry and why. Steve, I'm going to guess that making sure that the calculation of returns and the accurate flow of, of capital to the right people and the right entities is something that LPs care quite a lot about and, and care about getting right, correct? Everybody cares that they're getting the right share of a return. The challenge oftentimes can be at the GP level, so that upper tier entity where that was a negotiated deal and I can tell you no two are the same. Uh, and that's where you really get complications. So the split between the GP and the LP, you know, market standard, you're going to get to a 20% carry, but then where do those carry points go? I have one key piece of advice for anyone thinking of forming a first-time fund when we're thinking about these upper tier entities, and that is the first thing that you do should be to form the management company because you need a limited liability entity out there to sign contracts and to make operation, to start off operations um, and if you're doing it as an individual, it's very dangerous from a legal standpoint. Emerging managers or first-time funds are a unique opportunity set for us, uh, frankly, one that we really enjoy. Uh, typically, uh, first-time funds for us are three, deal, three or four deal professionals who've come together who want to become entrepreneurs. And uh, for us, that's exciting because we are entrepreneurs ourselves. So we get a seat at the table. We help our clients think through the ramifications of what it is going to take to launch the fund successfully. Uh, we have a boot camp that we call for first-time funds where we usually allocate an hour to go through uh, terms and how the fund's going to be managed. But what we really provide to a first-time fund is the ability to check the box as it relates to operating due diligence. Um, LPs are looking at a fund, first-time fund, no differently than they look at established fund and they expect to see uh, certain institutional processes. The boot camp uh, evolved serendipitously and we learned that it had success. What we find is that the uh, principals of the firm um, know the deal flow but they really haven't been involved in how to run the business of the business. There are certain GPs that are very sensitive to managing the IRR and there are techniques used, legitimate techniques, to help you know, in, enhance the IRR. And we have a conversation about what that means. What we've learned is while the managers are oftentimes focused on the returns that they'll generate for their LPs, they also need to be thinking about the business of their business. And that can go from you know, how the carry gets split, how management fees are structured, tax planning, personal planning. And they need to also think about um, future-proofing their business because remember, these funds have a 10 to 15 year life and things change and they need to put in a dynamic uh, to affect change. Oftentimes, we find that the sponsors really haven't thought about that aspect of the business. And so by dialogue and by engaging, we bring our experience of 25 years to the table to start to ask provocative questions.